Good morning everyone. My apologies for not being there with you in person, but I'm still really pleased to be able to give this short presentation via video at your conference archives 2.0, Interacting with the Future. It's a great opportunity for me to share my thoughts and to say to the archives um, what a fantastic position you are in to be an institution providing leadership, um, not least because of your custom and practice and experience as information managers, but what that means in the, the digital age where it's all about the internet, it's all about interactivity, and the internet really stands as, I think, the, one, one of the most fundamental changes in how democracy uh, it impacts on our lives, how it functions in the 21st century. I'd like to talk about those opportunities that the internet provides in a couple of ways. First of all, the general economic and, and social opportunities that exist. We, we see as a government that the internet is uh, the economic infrastructure of the future. We already know that it is essential into how our financial systems function, how commerce functions, uh, how we communicate with each other, how we pay our bills, how we find out uh, social information and organise our lives. So even to contemplate that it isn't going to be absolutely central to where we go next as a society and economy, uh, we'd, we'd just be deluding ourselves. It's for this reason that uh, this government is investing in the National Broadband Network. And whilst I don't want to dwell on this point, it's important to make the link. Whenever we're talking about doing things interactively online, you are confident that this government is closing the digital divide with a visionary policy that will ensure all Australians have affordable access to a high bandwidth network that's, that's very structure drives uh, competition at the retail end. So it makes good economic sense uh, to set up the whole NBN in the way that we have. It's also important to, I think, appreciate what it means for how we, how we do democracy. I get involved in a lot of conversations with both my constituents but also the broader community about well, how is the internet going to change the way we as citizens interact with government or as, or as voters interact with our politicians. Well, I firmly believe, again, it's changing everything. Uh, what people want is a sense of authenticity in their engagement with their representatives and with the governments that serve them. The internet is the perfect platform for this sort of interaction that is authentic. It's not token, it's not distant, it's not something that you provide input to and you never get any feedback. It's actually a, a potentially the most powerful one-to-one -one and uh, group environment where people can feel a part of not only decision making but the shaping of policies that will uh, serve us well in the future. So for me, it changes everything about how we interact at that socio-political level as well. Important to me as a politician, sure, but you can imagine for any government agency providing a service to citizens, it forms a, a bedrock into how those services are delivered and what the feedback loop is with the citizens they're serving. We talk about Gov 2.0, which is the interactive web and how it relates to the provision by government of services to citizens, but also how citizens engage with and provide information back to government. And Gov 2.0 is preoccupying this particular government quite a great deal, not least because we had a fantastic report prepared by the Gov 2.0 task force. I know representatives from the archives and the archive uh, movement more generally were great contributors to that report. And that report's recommendations were uh, almost 100% accepted by government and are now being implemented. I've often, I, I think it sets a wonderful blueprint and uh, strategic and practical path forward for interacting, uh, for, for making the government interactive and embodying those principles of Gov 2.0. And in that vein, I'd like to just touch on briefly how I like to characterise Gov 2.0. Many of you would have heard me say this before, but I describe it as having three broad elements or pillars. Uh, they are democratising data, releasing information collected by the government into the public domain and making it accessible and usable. Secondly, citizen-centric services, so using the putting the technology to work 
to more effectively serve citizens' needs in a, in a personalised way, if that's what people are wanting, but a seamless way. So it's not up to the citizen to be able to interpret the different portfolios, the different uh, spheres of government, local, territory, uh, federal, whatever. All of those things ought to be seamless for the citizen and the technology uh, has the power to deliver that if we've got the political will to establish it. And thirdly, democratic participation or government participation. What does the interaction between citizen government look like? How can we crowdsource the best ideas uh, with integrity and with substance and make citizens' ideas, influence, expertise truly valued and inputted into those decision making and, and policy uh, development processes? This is a really exciting area and I know many agencies and departments are already innovating. So with those three pillars, it helps to characterise the challenge that's ahead of all of us. I mentioned the Gov 2.0 task force and it too focuses on all of those, but has an additional uh, aspect which is really encouraging the leadership within government, both politically and uh, at the management administrative level, that a cultural and attitudinal change needs to accompany some of these innovations. What does that mean? Well. The citizens have chosen where they want to be and they're on social networks, the ones that already exist in the cloud. If we want to engage with citizens, I think as a government we really need to go where they are and that means allowing public servants to use social networks to interact or be more innovative in how the government has a presence within those social networks to gain the benefits of the interaction that they can provide. Just on that point, um, I recently uh, been awarded a, an international award on e-democracy because of public sphere. That was an initiative in my office, um, a collaboration between Pia Waugh, my advisor, who I know you'll be talking to soon, and it was designed to create an example of what a policy consultation can look like using those existing social networks. So please ask Pia any additional questions about that, but we think it's a, a good model uh, for you to look at if you're contemplating where to start when it comes to a, a conversation with interested stakeholders in your area in an online environment where you're using the tools that are already in the cloud. And finally, I'd like just to share, um, um, I guess, some observations about what's happening with respect to open data uh, here in Australia and around the world. There's been three phases, if you like, of development. and The first one is really publishing what you have. Um, it's the first step to open PSI, but it's really pushing it out there in a way that people can start to a uh, see what's see what's available, let people know that it's there, and coordinate. I guess what I call experimentation. Some of you will remember GovHack, which was the quite famous um, uh, day where, uh, through the course of the Gov 2.0 task force, new data sets were released. A bunch of people came together and they, yeah, there was a lot of pizza and Coca-Cola involved, that's set for certain. But got together and really mashed up those data sets and provided new knowledge based on the combination of newly released data sets. That's a great way to get people thinking and innovating with information that hasn't before been public, uh, now is. Um, amazing things have resulted and there's some fantastic case studies around the world about how data has been mashed together particularly when you add the power of um, geolocational data or geospatial information uh, to show, um, uh, to put a, a mapping overlay on that, that data. The second phase of development is, is stepping it up a, a little more. It's about how you publish, how usable is it, and this is about open standards, usability and making sure that the data that is put in the public domain is updated regularly. It's easy to just push data sets out there, but for any of you that were lucky enough to hear Andrew Stott speak uh, just last week at a, a conference um, about what's happening with open data, particularly in the UK, there's, there's data and there's data. It needs to be released in an open standard, in an open format, and it needs to be usable, and it needs to be updatable. That way it's truly a resource that can be innovative innovated with, with substance and meaning, and where the, the people who are accessing that data uh, can have confidence in its source. The third, I suppose, stage of development is crowdsourcing. 
what, what does the environment look like when you invite the community to help you keep your data updated? What is it about uh, accessing the expertise of the community that is now familiar with your data that can enhance its value both for the government and for the broader community using it? Um, there's one example, the Bushfire Connect uh, project, which is a, a community project which can update information by, via mobile phone, um, whether it's tweets, SMSs, uh, using websites. Um, that information coming in real time supplements the official knowledge about the event taking place. So it's a way of crowdsourcing incredibly important data that would not be able to be gathered in a, in a quicker, more efficient way or absolutely true to source. Uh, this is, you know, it's one of the, the innovations that I think we're still learning to trust the power of it. Um, another very simple example is Fix My Street where it's the citizens themselves that um, place data into the system which then informs or, or provokes a certain course of action by other parties to fix the street. How, co how confident we are in, in trusting our citizens to contribute in this way I think is one of the, the barriers. Um, but we need to determine ways to accept, to verify, to validate this type of crowdsourcing if we're going to harness the power of, of genuine interaction between citizen and government. It's my view that this interaction is what citizens are looking to do. I think within most people there is an enormous amount of goodwill and they would like to contribute to the betterment of their community and to the broader society. I think Gov 2.0 and providing these interactive places for people to participate uh, will help restore a broad confidence in the uh, role that governments play in our lives and give people a genuine sense of because they really are contribution to the to the public good. This more than anything else, this concept of contributing to the public good is something that I think is going to be a, a key motivator and underscore the success of many a fantastic GUT 2.0 project. So I think uh, in summing up, it's important to recognise we, we do have a long way to go uh, as a country, but we are at the top when it comes to innovating. I have travelled overseas recently and seen some fantastic innovations and know that here in Australia we've got some of the best innovation occurring both within our public and private sectors. But it will be the archive and those associated with archiving that remain I think at the forefront as in information managers and innovators in that digital environment that will continue to show necessarily the leadership to the broader sector about what can be achieved. And it's not just archivists either, it's information managers more broadly. You've always been central to the challenge of making sure information is accessible, is disseminated in a very democratic way and is organised in a way that makes sense to people. This isn't a new thing. Um, there is a, a formidable body of knowledge and experience behind it. It's the adaptation to the new open digital environment that sits at the heart of the challenge and I know you're all well placed to deliver a great outcome. There does need to be rigour when it comes to standards, to metadata, to systems of information management and as we proceed down a very exciting path as a government towards Gov 2.0, it's the, that, um, uh, the, the rigour and experience of the archive that will ensure that our time is well invested and that the systems we establish now are set up to be future proof, uh, to be fun and innovative for people to use and to, I think, stand the test of time in a really challenging new environment. So congratulations to all of you for participating in the conference. Uh, I look forward to hearing a report back about how it proceeds and once again I wish you all the best for all of your endeavours. Thank you very much.